So the next video we're gonna check out, right, is the tragic story of this famous meteorite. Inside the American Museum of Natural History in New York is this enormous iron meteorite. Jeez. It crashed into Earth here in Northwest Greenland around 10,000 years ago as a piece of space debris, and for centuries was used to make metal tipped tools and weapons by a small tribe of indigenous Greenlanders, the Inuquit, until an American explorer seeking fame and fortune dragged it across the Arctic and sailed it to New York to sell to the museum. But this giant piece of iron isn't the only thing brought here on that ship in 1897. Six Inuit came too, after being told they'd return home to the Arctic within the year, rich with weapons and tools if they agreed to be studied by the museum. Most of them wouldn't make it back. It's a story of false promises, hmm? big ambitions, and one small boy who would grow up to challenge the museum that took everything from him. Chapter. For centuries of human history, pretty much the only way to get iron was if it crashed into Earth from space in the form of meteorites. Like here, where 19 iron pieces, including this dagger, were found in Tutankhamun's tomb, which was sealed centuries before smelting technology developed in Egypt. Ancient Egyptians even had a hieroglyphic symbol for meteoric iron, which translates literally to metal of the sky. Indigenous groups in this part of the world were using meteoric iron too, like the Inuit, sometimes called Polar Inuit, who make up the northernmost band of Inuit. The ancestors of the Inuit first came to this part of Greenland around 1000 AD, and the chance existence of meteoric iron here was a crucial part of making this region inhabitable for humans at all. This area north of the Arctic Circle has always been harsh and extremely remote, but the Little Ice Age, which spanned from the 15th through early 19th century, froze ocean access to this region, making it even harder to reach. The Inuit lived in virtual isolation for centuries, until an expedition led by British explorer John Ross arrived in 1818 and came ashore. When he saw the iron-tipped knives, spears, and harpoons, Ross assumed at first that the metal must have washed up from a shipwreck, until the Inuit told him it came from a nearby mountain. Ross guessed that this iron mountain must be a crashed iron meteorite. But they might should have kept that one to themselves. I'd have been like, I don't know where it came from, bro. It's that. I don't know, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? That might would have saved them. Bad weather prevented the expedition from finding the iron mountain, which Ross later described as the most important mineral production of this country. This was the beginning of an increase in trade with European explorers as northern expeditions continued here throughout the 1800s several of which tried to find the meteorite, but never could. By the 1890s, the Inuit had become accustomed to trading with foreign ships for manufactured goods, metal tools, and weapons, and relied less on the meteorite as their sole source of iron, which is how an American explorer, hungry for fame and fortune, justified his decision to take it. At this time, the foreigner the Inuit interacted with the most- Y'all notice a pattern in history? Are y'all noticing that? The whole take? The tape part, that pattern. ...was this man, Robert Peary. He had come to this remote part of Northwest Greenland with one goal in mind, reaching the North Pole. Peary was part of an era of European and American exploration in the late 19th century, obsessed with the parts of the map not yet reached by white people. And in the case of the North and South Pole, not known to have been reached by humans at all. He's considered to be the first non-Inuit to study Greenlandic Inuit culture and survival methods, and throughout his years of exploring the Arctic, funded by his wealthy family and by groups like the National Geographic Society and Brooklyn Institute of Arts and Sciences, now known as the Brooklyn Museum, the Inuit taught Peary how to survive Arctic conditions and how to travel over the ice using sled dogs. They also worked as expert guides, hunters, dog handlers, and laborers during his Arctic expeditions. From a trade perspective, the relationship was beneficial to the Inuit, but it was much more enriching for Peary. While the Inuit got resources like guns, household items, and metal tools from Peary, Peary got furs and ivory from the Inuit, which, along with other cultural artifacts, he would bring back to New York and sell to support his efforts to reach the North Pole. When Peary's 1894 Arctic expedition failed, he knew he had to come home with something to keep his backers interested. And he knew from stories going back to John Ross in 1818 that the Inuit had access to a rare iron meteorite, 
maybe a big one. So in exchange for a gun to an Inuk man who said he knew the location of the Iron Mountain, Piri was led right to it. A lot of this history has been lost to time, but what historians do know is that Piri didn't ask permission for what he did next. After a mostly Inuit crew excavated two fragments of the meteorite found here and dragged them to Piri's ship using rope and wood rollers, Piri learned of a third, much larger fragment on this nearby island, too heavy to take on his ship. It would take multiple attempts over the next couple of years, returning to Greenland with a much bigger ship and specialized equipment, including heavy-duty jacks and even a custom-built railway, to excavate and then drag this largest meteorite across the Arctic landscape to the edge of the island and finally load the most expensive resource Piri ever extracted from the Arctic onto his ship bound for New York. Careful to frame his interactions with the Inuit as nothing but good-hearted and without coercion or exploitation, Piri orchestrated a few images about his removal of the tribe's local source of iron by staging- I couldn't really tell. Did it look like they were helping him? I gotta go back to that, bro. Like, when they was digging this out, I couldn't tell if those were Inuit people helping him excavate or not. Let's see. The people I'm seeing, you can't really tell. But it looks like that could be possibly their people at the front of the rope right there. You see what I'm saying? I don't know. And specialized equipment, including heavy-duty jacks and see? even a custom-built railway, see? to excavate and then drag this largest meteorite across the Arctic landscape to the edge of the island and finally load the most expensive resource Piri ever extracted from the Arctic onto his ship bound for New York. Maybe Careful they were manipulated in some type of way of, and, and them not knowing. Like he said, he was being very, very convincing, kind, nice, generous, all while devising this scheme in the back of his mind and in the background doing this to them. To frame his interactions with the Inuit as nothing but good-hearted and without coercion or exploitation, Piri orchestrated a few images about his removal of the tribe's local source of iron. By staging this scene, recreating the, as he put it, ancient practice of mining the meteorite for metal, and captioning this photo of the Inuit who moved it for him as a farewell to the Sabic Sol, the meteorite, who Piri later wrote, happily did all they could to put into my possession the iron mountain of their forefathers. But the meteorite wasn't all Piri took from the tribe to impress his backers in New York because an assistant curator for the American Museum of Natural History had asked a special request of Piri, that he bring back Inanook to be studied at the museum. Piri convinced six Inuit to come with him, a respected hunter and key provider in the tribe named Nutak, who brought his wife Atangana and their 12-year-old daughter Aviak, a young man named Wisa Kasak, and Kisuk, another skilled hunter who lost his wife to an epidemic brought on by one of Piri's earlier expeditions who brought with him his seven-year-old son, Minik. Piri didn't just promise to compensate the group handsomely for their journey, he also assured them they'd be taken care of by the museum for their entire stay in New York. But that's not what happened. When Piri's ship, with the giant meteorite and six Inuit on board, arrived in the Brooklyn Navy Yard in October 1897, it stirred up a lot of excitement. 20,000 people paid to board the ship and see the people and meteorite Piri had brought back which he pocketed to fund his further expeditions, and then left on a lecture tour promoting his latest thrilling adventures in Greenland, leaving the Inuit in New York to be studied at the American Museum of Natural History, where they were in- How do you just leave somebody to be studied? How do you study people like that? Like, how do you, after promising them so much, you just leave them, abandon them, and then they're just sitting there just having people just stare at them. I know they had to be looking around like, okay what is going on they probably got defensive probably attacked some people like what how do you do that initially forced to live in a damp hot basement inside the museum within days of exposure to the warmer climate and with no immunity from american diseases they were all hospitalized with respiratory infections minik's father kisuk was the first to die mm. the museum told minik they buried kisuk but that wasn't true Kisuk's body was dissected, and his remains were stored inside the museum for further study. No. Photos of his brain appeared in this 1901 scientific report. Soon after Kisuk's death, Atangana, Nuktak, and their daughter Aviak 
died of disease too. And we saw a Cossack asked to be sent back to Greenland, which left only Manik alone and the only Inuit in all of New York City by 1899, just nine years old. Manik had lost all- Yeah, I think they really caught diseases. Or did somebody give them something, cause them to go so their bodies could be studied? That's what I think happened. All contacts with Peary at this point. The explorer never came back for the people he convinced to come to New York and sold their meteorites to the museum for $40,000, an equivalent of more than a million dollars today. It took a few years for the museum to find a way to remove the meteorite from the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which they finally did in 1904, and just like in the Arctic, carefully dragged it through the streets of New York on wood rollers. And then a giant truck pulled by a team of horses all the way to the American Museum of Natural History, where it became a prestige item and major attraction for the museum. There's no record that Peary ever shared the fortune he got from the meteorite with Manik, the boy he brought to the museum and then abandoned. After his father died, Manik was taken in by a museum official named William Wallace and grew up in New York City under Wallace's care. He forgot his native language, Enoch Tun, and started going by the name Mene Wallace. Eventually, his foster family fell on hard times, and now impoverished, a teenaged Manik started asking questions about his father, Kisuk, and though it's somewhat unclear how, discovered the truth that the officials from the museum had lied to him, and his father's body had been desecrated without Manik's knowledge and was inside the museum, supposedly in the name of science. Starting in 1907, Manik took to newspapers to tell his story, and publicly pleaded that the museum return his father's remains so he could give him a proper burial. They ignored him. The following year, he called on Peary to help him leave New York and send him to his home in Greenland. Peary said there was no room on his ship. At least not until 1909, when there was suddenly a spot for Manik on one of Peary's ships bound for Greenland. It was right around the time Peary claimed that his recent Arctic expedition was the first to reach the North Pole and Manik was writing in American newspapers about how Peary treated his people when he was a boy, including taking the meteorite, which Peary put aboard his steamer and took for my poor people. I can never forgive Peary, and I hope to see him to show him the wreck he has caused. A few months before Peary returned to the US from his final Arctic expedition, Manik was on a ship back to Greenland. Before Manik left, he wrote the biggest regret he had about leaving America, that I must return home alone, leaving the body of my father who was taken from me, a martyr to the cold-blooded scientific study of your people. When Manik got home to Greenland, he needed to relearn his native language and inequip customs like hunting, kayaking, and dog handling. He'd only been around seven years old when Peary took him to the US after all. He eventually returned to the US in 1916, working as a lumberjack in New Hampshire. He died there two years later, one of the millions of victims of the 1918 pandemic. The museum never answered his repeated calls to return his father's remains. They kept the bodies of all four of the Inuit who died in their care for almost a century, until new appeals were made by author Ken Harper, who had published Give Me My Father's Body, a deeply researched book about Manik in 1986. The museum finally gave in to mounting pressure and returned the remains of Kisuk, Nuktak, Atangana and Aviak to Greenland in 1993. When we reached out to the American Museum of Natural History for comment, they acknowledged that their role in Peary bringing Manik and the five other Inuit to New York in 1897 included a series of unethical and unjustifiable actions, especially the morally abhorrent act of misleading Manik and refusing to return his father's remains. Only in October 2023 did the museum finally begin to reckon with the more than 12,000 human remains it's kept going back to the 1800s 12, and committed to removing all human remains. Now imagine how many other times they've done this. This is the, I was thinking that the entire time I was watching this. You know this ain't the first time. You know this ain't the only time. You know they've done this so many other times, right? 12,000 human remains. Out of those 12,000, come on. I know it's more than half remains from its display cases. But the meteorite Peary took is still there. It remains a signature wow. exhibit of the American Museum of Natural History, which the museum has described as the largest meteorite in captivity. 
A plaque displayed in front of the meteorite includes a passing mention that it was brought to the museum by American explorer Robert Peary. But nowhere in this room will you find a mention or a photo of Nanik or Kisuk or any of the six people that Peary left at the museum. They didn't deserve that. Photography, the art of freezing moments in time. The history of photography is the history of the technology that made it possible. And the evolution of the camera is for the very first time focusing its gaze backwards, not forwards. So let's get into it. We started with black and white portraits that required people to channel their inner statue, holding a pose for an eternity. Now don't anybody move. Is that downloaded by the way? So did the evolution of photography in pictures. Enter the flash bulb era. But taking a photo sounded like a small, sharp pop. And it was flashy, just like this outfit. What's crazy is my son or my kids will never know like how far, I'm gonna show them this video of course, but how far these cameras have, how long of a way we've come as far as cameras go, man. You know, I think I can go back as far as the the kind you have to little push the little thing to the side, like kind of like winding it up so then you can push the button and it take the picture. You know what I mean? Well, what's those like? The, then you have to take it to the to the store to get it developed. Different things like that. Like I go back to the little small rectangular ones that you put up to you. I go back that far now. I know some y'all are go back further than that than me, but that's how far I think I go back. Flip forward to a smaller, faster Those. Camera. Cameras that could capture for all time a short moment. A memory. Enter the vibrant era of the Polaroid. Leading the way with instant photography. A limited number of chances to capture the moments as they went by. Then came the digital age where we all became photographers. No longer for the few who could afford expensive kit and had the patience to wait. Our pocket-sized phone studios meet demands instantaneously and with the advent of digital manipulation and filters you can get mm, close to perfection every time. Suddenly everyone became a selfie connoisseur. Now this looks quite nice, quite strong now. But what about waiting? What about those magical minutes of anticipation? That's okay. the first time I take a picture of a dog. Is it? Oh, let's hope it's a good one when the promise of what might have been captured was more satisfying than mindlessly tapping a phone screen. New era in photography begins. Polaroid was the OG of instant photography. It was wildly successful at its peak in the 1970s with millions of sales. It was simple, Yo. it was all plastic, it was fast. You snap <laughs> Wait a minute, I never seen that one before. Hold on, hold on. Millions of sales. It was simple. Look at that, that looked like two cameras in one. Sheesh. Yeah, 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 yeah. They gotta make a comeback though. Like, I like those nostalgic cameras like that. It was all plastic. It was fab. You snap a photo, wait for the magic to happen, and hard copies of memories. You know how I got this car? It knocked over your garbage can. They've just made a new addition to their line. This is the Polaroid i2 instant camera. What they are pitching is a blend of nostalgia with the cutting edge tech of today. Analog charm with digital finesse, a sleek new design houses features like improved optics, autofocus and Bluetooth connectivity. Well, that's enough about what it can do. Let's go see how it actually performs. help out, I've invited along my colleague, Liv. We're going to have a bit of an instant breeze digital comparison, where I'll be tapping on the Polaroid and she'll be snapping on her phone. Okay, All okay. Right, let's swear. Unfortunately, I had a false start. Two in fact, which isn't the best when you've only got eight pictures per pack to play with. I mean, I think I've already taken about five. But it was third time lucky. Oh, and here oh. it is. We need to wait a few minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll reply to some emails. Okay. Yeah, tell me when you're ready. A few minutes later, wow. not a bad result from my instant pick, but I did waste two other pictures just getting there. All right, yeah, we can never go back. <laughs> like, I think I came across a, a camera my mom had 
where you would take the film out of this like little tube and then you pull it apart and stick one side and pull it over across to the other side or something like that. Am I getting that right? I think I remember that type of camera as well. But did you just see the difference in the two pictures? Yeah, we can't go back. Let me just dial in some seconds first. Just needs about half an hour or so. <laughs> ah, again. This time the picture got jammed and I had to take yet another one to get this result. Decent in comparison, wow. however, I could feel the cost per picture racking up. I mean, it has its place if you're trying to do like a film and you're trying to get that back in the day look, that older look, then using something like that will work for you. Been able to take that many photos in a few seconds and can just do that with a smartphone. You can't necessarily do that with that. It takes a bit of time to develop, to get it set up, and then even then, you don't really know what you're going to get. Uh, that not knowing and uncertainty carried on to our next photo op. It took me two attempts to figure out the correct settings to capture this shot of the bicycle. Wow. Whilst Liv's phone pics were quick, budget friendly and a breeze to edit, the Polaroid camera never crashed the photo shoot with unexpected interruptions. Oh, oh who's calling Sorry. me? <laughs> Sorry, let me put that away. Well, at least I would never get a call on this thing. Feeling something in your hands gives it a weight, the promise of a premium product and it's one of a kind, but in a world where photography is now so cheap, printing has become a luxury. That is the challenge now facing Polaroid. It may well mean that they cannot replay the dizzying success of their 70s heyday. It's remarkable what you can do, and you obviously you enjoy doing this, do you? Oh yeah, yeah. But they're choosing to believe in the promise of anticipation and hope their customers do likewise. A company can't survive on charm alone, so will the picture that emerges be a happy one? For a concrete answer, like the Polaroid's customers, we'll have to wait.